Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so yeah, over the last couple of weeks, we've been in a series called Reset, Rethinking Life as We Know It. In our first week, we talked about how God invites us to join Him in the new thing that He is doing, and how even in the midst of change and uncertainty, God is still working and inviting us to join in with what He is doing. Then last week, we talked about how Jesus gives us an opportunity for a new start. How the things that we did in our past no longer have any hold on us because of the power of Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross. We talked about a few stories from scripture that uh, gave examples of people experiencing Jesus and having and, and him giving them the opportunity for a new start or a reset. Now, this week we're going to be jumping into the newest installment of this series, and it's called A New Creation. One verse that's kind of unintentionally made its way into this series each week is Philippians 3, verse 12 to 14. And it just fits so well, so we're just going to start there again. It says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now you might be wondering, what does that have to do with the new creation? It doesn't say anything in there about that. Well, there's actually a lot in there that relates to the topic that we're talking about tonight. For one, this verse talks about forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what is ahead. We could even include, if we include our verse from our week one, our, uh, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, it says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. So this week, we're talking about becoming a new creation. Becoming a new creation through Jesus. And part of doing that is forgetting about what, who we used to be, or forgetting about the past mistakes, and, and pressing onwards and upwards for the good new thing, good new start, and good new creation that God has for us. So we're mostly going to be camped out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for the rest of our message. So I encourage you guys to open up your Bibles there if you have them, or if you have your uh, Bible app, you can follow along there. It's also going to be on the TVs beside me. Um, um, so feel free to take pictures of the slides, but if you want, I can even send them to you as well. So um, just come to me afterward and ask for them if you'd like them. But with all that said, uh, let's jump into the passage for tonight, which is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Now, if you remember the first week, we talked about how important context is. And this is another example of this. A good rule of thumb when you're reading scripture is when you see a therefore, you should ask what it's there for. So uh, let's explore that together. In chapter 5 of, of, chapter, uh, of 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about how Christ's death has changed the way he views people. Instead of looking at a person as a mere mortal human being, he must view those who are in Christ as something entirely different. Those who are in Christ are those who have faith in him, credited with Christ's righteous life. And their sin has been forgiven by Christ's death in their place. Such people are new creations. Those in Christ have become something that they were not before. Their identity has changed from being the fallen version of themselves to being associated with the righteousness of Christ. That's who they are now. In fact, the old version of a Christian, who they were before they were in Christ, is not recoverable. The old is gone, Paul writes. The new has come. All the old dreams and ideas and agendas and purposes have ceased to exist and have been replaced by Christ's ident identities, ideas, agendas, and purposes in an entirely new creature called a Christian. Paul's words are true in another way as well. The old way of humanity is also gone. The old way of the law is also gone. Christ is a long-promised new covenant that makes it possible for men and women to be made new once and for all, and for all eternity, with no possibility of returning to the old. So when Paul writes that those who are in Christ are new creations, he means that they are no longer what they once were. They are so much more. 
I'm going to say that again. When Paul writes that those who are in Christ are new creations, he means that they are no longer what they once were. They're so much more. Their dreams and the desires of Christians are now reset to f follow what Christ wants, not what we want. And sure, we all still mess up. We all still um, live outside of God's will sometimes. And we want things and we desire things when we're outside of God's will. But something that often happens when we live outside of God's will and when we, when we desire things outside of God's will, is that those things end up hurting us. But growing as a Christian is growing closer to God, drawing nearer to Him, wanting what He wants, aligning our will with His. Our hearts break for what breaks His. So when this happens, we are, we are living in step with the Holy Spirit. Being a new creation means forgetting the former things, not dwelling on the past, but forgetting what lies behind. This includes who you used to be. We're no longer identified by the things that we did, or the sports that we played, or the grades that we got, we're now identified with Christ, the God of the universe. For example, I'm no longer Zeke the goalie. Sure, I still play hockey, and I still play goalie, but it's no longer the identity of what it, what it used to be. Like, I used to identify myself as that, like, I'm, I'm a goalie. That's what I am, I'm a goalie. I'm gonna make the NHL, I'm gonna do all this, I'm a hockey player. That's no longer my identity anymore. My identity is now Zeke the Christian. I was made into a new creation with new desires when I started taking my faith seriously. Another part of becoming a new creation is the renewal of our minds. It says in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will. What, is God, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In order to grow closer to God, to live in step with his will, we must be transformed into the image of the Son. Renewing our mind, putting off our old sinful self, and putting on the identity of Christ. The new self created to be like God in righteousness and holiness, as Ephesians 3, uh, 4, 22 to 24 says. If we choose to follow Jesus, we must die to our desires and live for what God wants us to live for. Being made a new creation doesn't necessarily mean that we won't still struggle with sin. That's something that we're always probably going to have to deal with while we're still here living on earth until Jesus comes back. It's something that we're going to have to battle with until, until um, we leave this, place, leave this planet. But what it does mean is that we will always have a way to beat that sin when we are feeling tempted, when we are struggling with that. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So, like, I want to I wanna give, give you guys a little um, personal story to that. Like, for me, whenever I'm feeling tempted to lie, to look at something I'm not supposed to, um, something that often comes to my mind is Psalm 23. And it's like, like, it just comes to my mind, and I'm able to repeat that to myself. It's like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, that, that's something that wasn't even in my notes. That's something I had memorized, and I suck at memorizing. But because I spent time meditating on God's word, I was able to ingrain that in my spirit. And whenever I am feeling tempted or, or feeling like I'm going to sin, that's something that often comes to mind. That's, that's God's way out for me. And like, I want to I tell you guys a little bit more about this. It's like, um, oftentimes when people hear this verse, they think, oh, God's not going to give me more than I can handle. God's not going to give you more than you can handle. It, it says in the Bible, it's not going to give you more than you can handle. It's not going to give you more than you can handle. That's not true at all. He's going to give you more than you can handle. But the thing is, when he does that, he does it to draw you nearer to him. When it comes to temptation and sin, he's not going to give you more than you can bear. That's different. Right? So God promises that when you're in a situation where you're tempted to sin, 
but there's always going to be a way out. But let's kind of go back to our main passage for tonight, which is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. So this verse can actually literally be translated, if anyone is in Christ, new creation is here. And that's not just talking about the individual Christian. It's not talking about the individual person that became a Christian. It's talking about the whole of creation starting to become new, starting to be made new. Each time someone comes to Christ, we get a little closer to what the world is supposed to be like in unity with God. So let's continue reading that, um, that passage there in uh, 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So here's what all that means. In Jesus, we are invited to be made new, and we are invited to go into the world as his agents of reconciliation, and we are to have a ripple effect on the people around us, inviting them to get a taste of what it's like to live in this new world, in God's new world. We are made to be Christ's ambassadors, his representation to the world. So how we act reflects other people's view of God. In a lot of ways, you might be the only Jesus that anyone ever meet, that someone, some people ever meet. That's, pretty, that's a pretty high calling, right? We, we've, been, we've been called to such a high standard that we are, we are Christ's ambassadors, we are his representation to the world. So it, it is so important how we represent ourselves. Being a person of integrity and honesty is so vital. And on the other side, hypocrisy is one of the biggest things that turns people away from Christ. We say one thing and we do another, as, as Christ's ambassadors shouldn't be. As his ambassadors, his new creations, we have to conduct ourselves in a new way. We have been set apart and we, no long, and we are no longer what we once were. We have a fresh slate and a new start, like we talked about last week. The things that we have done in our past no longer define us. They no longer hold us captive. We are now identified along with Christ. It says in Romans 6, verse 6 to 14, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be kept be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count ourselves dead to sin, but alive in God, in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Our sins no longer hold us in captivity because we are forgiven we're made new. We have been given a reset through Jesus. We know this because it says in Hebrews 8, 12, For I will forgive their wickedness and their, remember their sins no more. And Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. This is affirmed once again in Psalm 103, verse 12. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. So if our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west, 
when we become new creations through Jesus, why do we keep running back and longing for that sin that was taken from us? Why do we long to be the old creation that is gone? God's grace is sufficient, and we, are no longer, we no longer need to be shackled in the chains of sin and ungrace. Since we've been set free from our sins, since we have been made new, we can now live for God today. And we do not need to worry about what problems tomorrow will bring. We must strain forward to what lies ahead. This reset that we have as new creations in Christ gives us the opportunity to let go of past weights that we still try to carry. Christ's death on the cross made it so that we do not need to carry the weight of our own sin any longer. We can go, we can let go of that and let God lead us in the way that he wants us to go. We have been covered by Christ's righteousness and we have been justified in him. Before we head to our small groups, I just want to, I just want to remind you all of the main point of this message that being, made, being a new creation means that we are no longer what we once were. We are so much more. The dreams and desires of a Christian are now reset to follow what Christ wants, not what we want. So let's strive onwards and upwards toward becoming a new creation that Christ desires us to be. Let's pray. Hey God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for all the youth that are here. Uh, Lord, I pray that as we go to our small groups, I pray that you would help that there would be great discussion. I pray that you would help us to have a great rest of our evening. Uh, I pray that you would help us to really understand what it means um, to be new creations, Lord. To be no longer um, shackled by the sins, uh, by the shame and, and by sin. And Lord, I just pray that you would you would go for us and go go after us, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that as we go to our small groups, that you would just help us to dive deeper into these conversations, Lord, about what it means to be a new creation, what it means to be an ambassador for you. And Lord, I just thank you for, for all the, everyone here tonight. Um, Lord, I just pray you bless them, and you bless the rest of our evening. I pray all this in Jesus' name.